Listen in on this week's Scientific American 60 Second Science Podcasts. I'm podcast editor Steve Mursky. Just as we humans understand the shape of our surroundings by how light reflects off objects, bats use reflections of sounds they produce instead, what's called echolocation. But despite their excellent sensing abilities, one type of obstacle vexes the animals, smooth vertical surfaces, like windows, because windows reflect almost all the bats' calls away from the bats at an angle, creating the illusion of empty space. To better understand it, you can actually use a visual analogy. Stefan Greif, a sensory ecologist at the Max Planck Institute for Ornithology. Imagine standing in a dark room, he says, beside a mirror. And that if you take a flashlight into your hand and shine it from the side onto this mirror, uh, you would see that all the light is being reflected away. You would see it on the other side of the wall. Um, so even visually, this would see, look to you like it's, there's a hole in the wall. There's nothing coming back from this place. Light wouldn't come back to you unless you aimed the flashlight more or less perpendicular to the mirror. And same for bats and their calls. This perceptual glitch meant that in lab tests, 90% of the bats banged into a smooth vertical surface. And by the way, the researchers say that none were hurt. But here's the interesting bit. Bats never smashed into a smooth horizontal surface. Greif says that's because plenty of horizontal planes exist in nature, like lakes and ponds. And even though a lake reflects calls away from the bat, bats have evolved to perceive the absence of sound reflections from horizontal surfaces as water. In fact, previous studies have shown that bats will actually dip down for a drink from smooth horizontal surfaces, whether they're water-filled or not. The study's in the journal Science. So what are conservationists to do with this information? Obviously, we have to be realistic, right? I mean, we can't start making all our windows rough and textured. But if we build near crucial bat habitats, we could install acoustic deterrents to drive the flying mammals away from buildings. Certainly, you could start looking at architectural possibilities uh, if you don't make a smooth surface um, smooth all the way, but like start making little ridges inside or like, yeah, like a mosaic, for example. And perhaps bat-friendly architecture would result in new designs, pleasing to human perception, too. For Scientific American's 60 Second Science, I'm Christopher Intagliata. Up in California's High Sierra, above the dense pine forests, rocky habitats reign. And if you look carefully among the boulders, you might see a pika, a rabbit relative the size of a hamster, with round ears and big eyes. Hikers oftentimes see them with little bouquets of wildflowers sticking out of their mouth as they run back to uh, their homes to cache them in hay piles. Joseph Stewart, a conservation biologist at the University of California, Santa Cruz. Maybe I'm a little bit biased. Other people tell me they're very cute, um, and I would agree. I, I find them majestic. I feel like they're, you know, the lords of the mountain. Stewart is also a skilled spotter of pikas. Uh, <laughs> you could say I've got a little bit of experience with that. Which makes it all the more strange that in five years of surveys of 64 square miles of high mountain rocky habitats near Lake Tahoe, he found no pikas at all in an area littered with decades-old pika droppings. It's relatively pristine habitat in the center rather than the edge of historic pika territory. So Stewart suspects the most likely culprit for this local extinction is rising temperatures due to climate change, and the mercury is heading higher. By 2050, uh, we expect there's going to be a 97% decline in the area of climatically suitable habitat for the species in the greater Tahoe area. The studies in the journal PLOS One. Pikas can still be seen elsewhere in Tahoe and in other parts of the Sierra Nevada, especially further south, where loftier summits allow pikas to roam higher to escape rising temperatures. But Stewart still worries about their eventual fate. Yeah, we're depriving future generations of the opportunity to see this really cool critter. And pikas have been around for longer than humans have been around. What right do we have to cause pikas and all of the other species that are vulnerable to climate change to go extinct. For Scientific American 60 Second Science, I'm Christopher Intagliata. As Houston begins recovery efforts from Hurricane Harvey, a new storm threat, Hurricane Irma, is barreling west towards the Caribbean and Florida. We have few defenses against hurricanes lashing rains and wind and storm surge, but nature 
does provide one. Wetlands act in, in two ways to reduce the impacts of storms. Uh, they reduce storm surge by acting as a, as a wall or a barrier, and uh, they act as a sponge by soaping up the, the waters uh, that come down via rainfall. Michael Beck is a coastal scientist at the Nature Conservancy and the University of California, Santa Cruz. He says as we've paved over swampy coastlines, we've changed how storm waters flow. Or, for an analogy a little closer to home, Rain falls on your driveway, it's going to run straight out into the street. Rain falls in your garden, it's going to soak into the ground. And so when you've done that at the scale of whole watersheds, There's no place for the water to go when it rains. But some wetlands do remain. Beck and his colleagues teamed up with the insurance industry and using the industry's risk assessment models asked, how much more damage would Hurricane Sandy have delivered if all the eastern seaboard's wetlands were gone? And they found that marshy coastlines saved some $625 million in direct flood damages, or about 1% of Sandy's total cost. Researchers also battered Ocean County, New Jersey, with thousands of hypothetical storms using flood models. And they found that wetlands cut flood damages there by 16 percent, compared to areas of the county where wetlands are gone. The studies in the journal Scientific Reports. Next, it's up to local governments and the insurance industry to take notice. Certainly we hope that we will continue to conserve wetlands in part for their intrinsic beauty and for the importance of nature. But he says by putting a price tag on the economic benefit of wetlands, it might change the conversation about conservation. For Scientific American's 60 Second Science, I'm Christopher Intagliata. On March 11th, 1437, Korean royal astronomers noticed something out of the ordinary in the night sky. There was a brand new star they had never seen before that was between two of the well-known stars in the tail of Scorpius. That star was only seen for 14 days, and then it disappeared and was never seen again. Michael Shera, an astronomer at the American Museum of Natural History in New York. He's spent more than two decades puzzling over this star that winked at astronomers nearly 600 years ago. You know, it's a many-sided jigsaw puzzle, and I won't say we filled in all the pieces, but at least I think we've got the, the corners and then the boundaries pretty much in place now. What he and his colleagues have determined is this. The disappearing star the Korean astronomers spotted, it was in fact a massive explosion produced by a special type of binary star system known as a cataclysmic variable. That system consists of two stars. One's a white dwarf. So it's the corpse of something that used to be a star in the distant past. It's what's left after the star died. And its companion is a hydrogen-rich star, pretty much like our sun. And the white dwarf's gravity is so powerful that it can suck hydrogen off of that companion. So in essence, it's cannibalizing its companion hydrogen-rich star. That hydrogen flows into a ring around the white dwarf. And then every few months or few years, the ring builds up, becomes more and more massive, and then collapses down onto the white dwarf. That gives rise to what we call dwarf nova eruptions. But every couple hundred thousand years, those dwarf eruptions are punctuated by much bigger bangs as more and more hydrogen builds up. You blow up as a gigantic hydrogen bomb. That's a thermonuclear event. And that classical nova is what happened in 1437 to this star. Shara's team located the cosmic remains of that huge explosion, and they were able to determine that the nova of 1437 and smaller dwarf nova eruptions photographed in that same square of sky in the 1930s and 40s were actually hiccups of light from the same binary star in different phases of its life cycle. And hence dwarf novae and old novae are the same thing just like butterflies and caterpillars are the same things. The study is in the journal Nature. Shara says 50 of these nova-like fireworks explode every year in the Milky Way, illuminating the galaxy and perhaps our understanding of the evolution of stars. For Scientific American's 60 Second Science, I'm Christopher Intagliata. Ben Van Allen collects caterpillars. While doing postdoctoral research at Louisiana State University, Van Allen saw that some of the caterpillars were having others for lunch. Rather than cry over his losses, Van Allen took advantage of the cannibalism for his research. Generally speaking, at least, it's nutritious to eat members of the same species because they have all the nutrients that are already inside you. So it's a 
very easy to process meal. It also reduces the amount of competition you're going to experience. Um, it's just one fewer individual trying to eat the same food you are in the same area. And it's usually easy to find members of the same species, too, since they live the same place you do. Van Allen and colleagues collected the caterpillars to study disease transmission in Lepidoptera, moths and butterflies. After observing the cannibalism, they wondered if their subjects' appetite for each other might be dangerous for the individual if it ate an infected cousin, but benefit the group by removing the infected individual from the population. Our main point is that while that is an individually risky thing for cannibal, as populations are more cannibalistic, they actually start preventing diseases from getting into the population in the first place. Van Allen's study is in the journal American Naturalist. It was released at the same time as a study in the journal Nature, Ecology, and Evolution that showed that chemicals produced by plants can ward off caterpillars by inducing the caterpillars to eat each other instead of the plants. But it would be kind of an ironic thing if a disease was coming into this caterpillar population and the plants caused them to become more cannibalistic and that prevented the disease from coming in and actually ended up worse for the plant than it was in the first place. Worse for the plant because the cannibal behavior caused the caterpillar population to wind up healthier and hungrier. For Scientific American 60 Second Science, I'm Emily Schwing. Internet companies often receive requests by law enforcement for customer info to help with ongoing investigations. Rarely, however, will a court order hit up a web hosting company for upwards of 1.3 million IP addresses to find out who's been visiting a particular website. That's exactly what happened recently when the U.S. Justice Department tried to get the company DreamHost to turn over contact info, emails, photos, and data related to a website called Disrupt J20. Disrupt J20 has been involved in organizing protests against the Trump administration. DreamHost bristled at the court order and filed an appeal. Company special counsel Chris Gazarian told me that DreamHost rarely gets requests to turn over that much client information. IP addresses in particular can identify which computers visited a site, when they visited, what they viewed, and for how long. IP addresses can also be used to reveal a web user's identity. The Justice Department later revised its request, saying it was not going to force DreamHost to turn over text and photos from blogs written but never posted to disrupt J20. A Washington, D.C. Superior Court then further amended the government's request. The judge asked the Justice Department to list the names of all government investigators who will have access to DreamHost's data and to explain how it will search through the data to gather evidence against Trump dissenters. Justice is also barred from sharing the information with other government agencies. We'll see whether the government ends up prosecuting anyone using DreamHost's data. If that happens, it could drive digital civil disobedience to encrypted mobile apps or possibly the dark web, a largely uncharted online realm where it's easier to remain anonymous. That would raise disturbing questions about the state of citizens' First Amendment rights in the U.S. these days. For Scientific American's 60-Second Science, I'm Larry Greenmeyer. <laughs>